a long time now, I have wanted to understand and build an electric motor. So, with the recent experience from making a historic design under my belt, there was no better time for me to try my hand at a more modern and perhaps even useful design. First, I had to decide on some basic properties for the motor. Starting with the type, there are a plethora of different types of motors out there. Brush direct current, synchronous, brushless direct current, homopolar induction, and so on. Each of these types have their own pros and cons, as well as most optimal use cases. I ended up settling on a brushless direct current, or BLDC motor. A BLDC motor is characterized by having no commutator to control the motor's electromagnets. And no commutator means no brushes. This is desirable because brushes create sparks, wear out over time, and are just generally very noisy. So, instead the electromagnets in the motor are controlled from an electronic speed controller. Next I had to decide whether I was going to make a radial flux or an axial flux motor. The difference between the two is the orientation of the magnets. The magnets can be perpendicular or parallel to the axis of rotation, resulting in a radial flux or an axial flux design respectively. Usually, motors are made in a radial flux configuration because it is a much more mature design philosophy and it's easier to manufacture. However, an axial flux design is often more efficient and has greater power to weight ratio. I decided on making an axial flux design because I had always planned on using 3D printed parts in this project, and 3D printers are excellent in producing the complex parts required for an axial flux motor. Since I had decided to make a brushless motor, I was forced to have the electromagnet coils on the stator and the permanent magnets on the rotor. I then noticed that doing this would mean that half of the magnetic flux generated by the electromagnets would just go to waste. So, to remedy this, I chose to add a second rotor to the design. The last detail I figured out before starting the build process was the number of electromagnets and permanent magnets. This was fairly easy though, since the BLDC design necessitates that the number of electromagnets be a multiple of three, and the way that a BLDC motor is controlled in turn necessitates that there be four permanent magnet poles for every three electromagnets. This means that I just had to pick a valid combination, and I ended up picking the combination of six electromagnets to eight magnetic poles. Generally though, you would pick a combination based on whether you want more speed or more torque out of your motor. Finally, it was time to start building the motor. First, I made a 3D model of the motor, which contains all of the different components I was going to have to make and how they would be situated. I then started by making the rotors. I 3D printed some parts to align all the magnets properly as well as contain a large washer that I figured would act as an iron backing to the magnets. An iron backing usually helps to magnetically couple the magnets together, thus generally increasing the quality and uniformity of the magnetic field produced by the permanent magnets. I'm not sure the washer in my case was a good idea, but I did it anyways. I fixed the magnets to the rotor with super glue which is actually not a good idea since superglue deteriorates and breaks up at about 80 degrees Celsius. However, I realized that the PLA plastic I was using for 3D printing all the parts would deform and create problems already at 60 degrees Celsius. So I figured that I would have bigger problems on my hands before the superglue would fail. The magnets were installed in a Hallbach configuration, which is a way of orienting the magnets to create a stronger magnetic field on one side of the magnets and the weaker one on the other. Stronger magnets are always better, so that's why I went for it. After making the rotors, I continued by making the stator. This also meant making the electromagnet coils for the motor. To make the task easier on myself, 
I built a simple winding and counting mechanism. When winding the electromagnet coils, it's extremely important that all of the coils have the same number of turns and, in general, be as identical to one another as possible. Eventually, I ended up with the necessary 6 coils with 52 turns on each, which was simply the maximum number of turns I could reliably fit on a coil and still have it fit in the stator. Next, it was time to solder the coils together, which was easier said than done with the pure chinesium soldering iron I have. First, I connected the opposing coils on the stator in series, giving me the required three phases. After which, I took the same end of each phase and soldered them all together. This has the effect of creating what's called a Y configuration. This way of connecting up the phases means that by choosing which phase to connect to power and which one to ground, we can control which electromagnets produce a north or a south pole. The alternative to this wiring is the delta configuration, but since most low power BLDC motors use the Y configuration, and it's decidedly easier to make, I just went with the Y configuration. Meanwhile, the structural parts of the motor had been printing away and I was now finally ready to assemble the motor. I used a 6mm diameter steel rod as the shaft for the motor, some ball bearings to couple the rotating parts of the motor to the stationary parts, and an excessive amount of nuts and bolts to align and fix everything together. The assembly process took some time, But eventually the motor was assembled. Now all that remained was to power up the motor. However, as alluded to before, we need to actually control the way power is applied to the motor for it to spin. In a simplified way, first the A phase gets connected to power and the B phase to ground, while C phase is not connected to anything. This causes the electromagnets in phase A to generate south poles and the electromagnets in phase B to generate north poles. The permanent magnets on the rotor then rotate and align themselves to the electromagnets. Next, phase A remains connected to power but phase B gets disconnected, while phase C gets connected to ground. This means that phase A electromagnets still generate south poles but now instead of phase B, phase C generates the north poles. The permanent magnets on the rotor then once again rotate to match the electromagnet poles. Then phase A gets disconnected, phase B gets connected to power, and phase C remains connected to ground. After which, phase A gets connected to ground, phase B remains connected to power, and phase C gets disconnected. The next step has phase A remain connected to ground, phase B disconnected, and phase C connected to power. And finally, phase A gets disconnected, phase B gets connected to ground, and phase C remains connected to power. As we can see, the rotor has now rotated by 90 degrees, and if we were to repeat these six steps again, it would rotate another 90 degrees. The job of the speed controller, then, is to do these six steps extremely quickly with roughly the correct timing. Now that everything was finally ready, I applied power and tried to spin the motor. The motor couldn't start on its own, so I gave it a little helping hand. So, the motor worked, but it definitely had trouble spinning up, and when I tried to rotate it by hand, I could feel that there was a fair bit of resistance. Luckily, I knew that the most likely cause for this were the ball bearings I had used. So, I disassembled the motor to modify the bearings. I removed the protective sidings from the bearings, 
as well as cleaned off the thick grease that the bearing comes with, and then applied my own lubricant. Doing this allows the bearings to have less resistance, but also suffer from higher wear. Since this motor is just for learning and for fun, then I was fine with it. I then reassembled the motor and tried again. The motor now started and ran much better, but it was still not perfect. Out of curiosity, I also tried to stall the motor by hand, but I was not able to. I then decided to start testing the motor, and the first test I wanted to conduct was to figure out the motor's KV rating. This is a number that roughly tells you how fast the motor will spin at a given supply voltage. First, I needed a way to measure the rotation speed of the motor. For this, I used another Arduino Nano clone and the photo interrupter. Now that I had a way to measure the rotation speed of the motor, I hooked two phases up to a multimeter in AC voltage measurement mode, and then used an electric drill to rotate the motor. I recorded both the produced voltage and the rotation speed from which I could determine the KV. However, this was only one phase pair and I had to do this again for the other two phase pairs. At this point, it turned out that something had gone wrong with one of the phases because while two of the phase pairs had nearly identical voltage outputs, the third pair had a much higher voltage. I figured that this might be the reason why the motor has trouble starting up at first. In the end, the KV rating I got for this motor was around 230. The next thing I wanted to figure out about this motor was its efficiency. Efficiency of a motor is determined by how much of the electrical input power actually gets converted into mechanical power. To do this, I used more or less the same method that I used for determining the power output of my air pressure engine. I employed a prony brake to act as a load while also logging the speed, which is essentially a dynamo. Both the load and the rotation speed were constantly being sent to my computer and at the same time I made a note of the indicated voltage and current supplied by my desktop power supply. I ran these load tests with different amounts of load and throttle on the motor, but at one point, my prony brake exploded. Despite this, the motor did end up showing an efficiency of over 50%, which is better than any existing internal combustion engine, but still a long way from existing production electric motors. As a final test to the motor, I wanted to find out the maximum speed, since I was not entirely sure whether the 3D printed parts are strong enough for this, I cowered under the table and tried to protect my hand from any potential shrapnel with a hunk of metal. I then started the data logging and applied maximum thrust. I was glad to learn that the motor does not in fact explode. Looking at the data, it looks like on average my setup here could get the motor up to around 2650 revolutions per minute. Before I wrapped up the project, I also was curious about the weight of the motor. Ironically, the only scale I had on hand that I could use for this was the same load cell that I used for the dynamo. As it turns out, the motor weighs around 830 grams which is certainly on the heavy side for the power output. All in all though, I am fairly satisfied with the results I did get, and I now know what to look out for the next time I make a motor. That's it for this project though, if you have any questions or want to share any of your own electric motor experience, then I encourage you to comment down below. I also welcome any ideas on the kinds of projects I could explore in the future and do also give a thumbs up and subscribe if you liked the video. I hope you all have a great day, and I will see you next time.